Henry and Veronica took a long walk around the camp. Sabrina feared they were bitter again, but when they returned, they were hand in hand. They looked the way Sabrina always remembered them, happily in love. By evening, everyone ran out of ways to keep themselves busy, and they were dying for news from the army. The family sat together in the mess tent, quietly picking through beast stew and cornbread when Red Riding Hood and Mr. Canis entered. It was clear the little girl had been crying. Perhaps it was due to another startling memory. I remember the master's face, she said. You did? Sabrina cried, hopefully. Mr. Canis shook his head. Not entirely. I remember that the face was unusual. It changed a lot. Sometimes it was scary and sometimes it was kind. Like he has two heads? Sabrina asked, her curiosity peaked. That's all she remembered so far, the Canis said. We're, tra- we're going to stop for the evening. The tone of the child is too much. Granny took Red into her arms. You are very brave, Liebling. I'm trying, Red sighed. Sabrina, however, was irritated. Didn't Red understand how important it was to uncover the identity of the master? Why was it so hard to remember his face? A frantic guard rushed into the tent. The soldiers, they're back! Everyone rushed into the courtyard. As the just as the massive fort gate swung open. Sabrina was expecting another defeated crowd, but instead a triumphant fleet of soldiers marched into the camp cheering, singing, and carrying Prince Charming on their shoulders. We destroyed the Marina, Snow White announced to the Grimms. We took them completely by surprise. She too was suddenly lifted onto a troll's troll's shoulder and paraded through the camp. The marina? Henry exclaimed. I thought the plan called for an attack on the sheriff's office. That's what we all thought, but once we marched out of camp this morning, Charming changed his mind, Rip Van Winkle reported. The man is a genius. William, we're confused, Granny wrote across to the prince. Well, rather, we have good news and bad news, he replied, jumping down from his perch. The good news is we cut off a very important supply line for the master. The bad news is we have a traitor within our ranks. Someone in this camp fed our battle plans directly to the Scarlet Hand. I suspected it all along. It proved true today. I was at Nottingham's office, Goldilocks chimed in. The entire Scarlet Hand army was there waiting for us. If we had gone there, we probably wouldn't have come back. So, you went to the marina to finish the original plan? Daphne cried. Gravy! Exactly. The hand never saw us coming, Charming said, puffing out his chest proudly. I suspect our saboteur and our spy are the same person. We now urgently need to find out who that person is before they can do any more damage. Worry about it tomorrow, Snow Crow. These people need to celebrate. We showed the master, didn't we? The crowd roared. Have a little fun. You deserve it, she cried. Tables were conjured, candles were lit, and the wine flowed freely. There was dancing and singing, and soldiers shared battle stories that grew more exaggerated with each telling. Sabrina spotted Morgan Le Fay and Mr. Seven dancing beside the supply tent. He was standing on a chair so the two could be cheek to cheek. Snow was right. Everyone needed a little celebration, but Sabrina couldn't help worrying about the spy. There were hundreds of other actors in the camp, many of whom she didn't know at all. Any one of them could be walking against the army. I wonder what the spy has planned for us tonight, she grumbled to her family. Granny shook her head. It's a terrible shame that someone would tell their own people. It could be anyone, Daphne said. 
Did anyone find any clues? Uncle Jake shook his head. I searched the garden more thoroughly this morning. There was nothing there. The chicken coop was a total bust, Daphne said. I've been so worried about the refugees I forgot to go back to the army. Armory, Sabrina admitted. I searched it myself, Henry said. There were no clues, but I suspect whoever broke all those arrows came in through the window. They must have been little. Suddenly, Sabrina remembered the little wooden object that she had caused her to fall in the armory. She dug it out of her pocket and showed it to the group. I found this thing, she said. Everyone grew quiet. Sabrina herself was so surprised she could barely speak. It's a little leg, Granny said. A little wooden leg, Veronica said, picking it up and examining it. It looks like one of Pinocchio's marionette legs, Daphne added. How did it end up in the armory? Sabrina asked, but the looks on her family members' faces told her the answer. It can't be him, Granny said. It can totally be him, Uncle Jake said. What other explanation would there be, Mr. Canis said. He showed up out of nowhere. We don't know where he's been, who he's been talking to, or why he came back. Wait, do you really think Pinocchio is the spy? Sabrina asked. Granny's face fell. Poor Geppetto, he'll be heartbroken. What can we do? Veronica asked. Should we confront him? Mr. Canis stood without a word and hobbled toward Pinocchio's tent. Everyone followed. He used his cane to lift the tent's flap. Inside were a hundred finished marionettes, along with several thick blocks of wood and a carving knife. On one wall of the tent shone a blood-red handprint. The old man searched through the marionettes until he found one with a missing leg. The one Sabrina had found the armory fit, and the armory fit perfectly. He tossed both pieces angrily to the ground. Anybody have any doubts now? Henry asked. It appears the party is over, a voice called. Pinocchio stood in the doorway. Sabrina spun on him. Explain yourself, she growled. The master came to me with an offer I couldn't refuse. He's going to help me correct a blue fairy's mistake. Soon I will be. Soon I will abandon this childish form and finally be a man. And it doesn't matter to you that you're putting the rest of us in grave danger, she asked. Your father is here. What if he gets killed because of the things you are doing? My father is safe. The master has made that promise to me. Oh, don't look at me with such shock. Do you have any idea what it's like to be seen and spoken to as a child every day? Uh, yeah, Daphne snapped. Tried for hundreds of years. Not never allowed to grow up because I'm trapped in this little boy's body. The blue fairy thought she was giving her a gift, but look how she has cursed me. The master will correct this injustice. And if people die in the process, Uncle Jake cried. He snatched the boy up by, he snatched the boy by the collar and pushed him against the wall of the tent. That's entirely up to you, Jacob. You don't have to be his enemy, Pinocchio said. The master can be your friend. He can give you anything you want. You could wish your princess back to life and you would make it happen. All you have to do is give up your fight. You're disgusting. Your friend killed the woman I love. Granny stepped forward and tried to calm her son, but Jake refused to back down. He's just a boy, she said. No, Mom, he's not. You heard him. He's a monster, Jake shouted. Where do we put him so he can't cause any more trouble? Before anyone could answer, a horrible roar filled the air and shook the walls of the tent. Sabrina recognized the sound. Dragon, she cried. Panic rose up throughout the camp. Through the doorway, Sabrina saw people running to around frantically screaming and crying. Ever afters were trembling one another in the melee. Knights sprinted through the courtyard with swords drawn. 
In the madness, Pinocchio pulled free from Jake. He darted out into the crowds, disappearing from sight. Puck was eager to chase after Pinocchio, but Granny stopped him. We'll catch him later. Right now, we have to help everyone to safety. The family raced out from the tent. Charming was outside, climbing on top of the table with his sword in hand. Get to your post. Remember your training. We can fight this thing. A violet cover a dragon with the face of a cat appeared on the horizon. It circled the camp like a vulture preparing to feast. Three just swooped over the fort, Robin Hood shouted, pointing north. But I think there are at least ten in total. One blasted the west wall. I sent guards to put out the fire, but the water tower valve is broken. There's no way to get any water to the hoses or the cannons. Granny Rhoda took a deep, steadying breath. Veronica, I seem to remember you were pretty good with men mechanical gizmos. I fixed a few leaky heat. A few leaky sinks in my day, Veronica said. You're the best we've got. Get over to the water tower and see if you can't get those valves working. Veronica raced off to do what she could. Henry, get up to the east tower and switch that water cannon on, Granny Rhoda said. As soon as Veronica has the water working, try to knock those dragons out of the air. But the girls... Henry, they'll be fine, she reassured him. Besides, I've got a job for them that will keep them safe. Trust me. Henry still looked worried, but he nodded. The conversation he'd had with Sabrina seemed to make a difference. It was clear that trusting his daughters didn't come naturally to him, especially when there was danger. But somehow, he forced himself to let go. He raced off to do as he was told. Puck took his sword from his belt, Oh, right. Well, I guess I have to go up there and kill some flying iguanas, he said with a grin. Actually, I need you to help the girls, and it's a job only a mischievous juvenile delinquent like yourself can do. How do you feel about throwing some rocks? The old woman asked. Puck grimaced. I hardly think a few rocks will take down a dragon. Granny pointed behind her at one of Borman and Swineheart's catapults. A giant boulder was already loaded in, into its arm. Several more sat nearby. Puck rubbed his hands together eagerly. I'm in. Kana stepped forward. Well, now perhaps it's time to bring the wolf back to the fight. I believe I now have the ability to control him, and I have to draw in my... Absolutely not, old friend, she scolded. We can manage without that monster. Besides, I'm going to need you and Red to get me through this camp once it's safe. Everyone raced to do their jobs. Sabrina studied the catapult closely. Despite its crude appearance, it was incredibly complex. It had dozens of knobs and buttons, as well as an intricate series of weights and counterweights. Puck aimed it while Sabrina and Daphne pushed buttons and pulled ropes. When a black dragon with a white tusk buzzed past the fortress, Sabrina shouted for Puck to fire, but he refused. We have to wait until it's lined up perfectly, he said. Don't worry, we'll get another chance. I don't want another chance. Just shoot the thing down, Sabrina said. It's coming right at us. The dragon made a beeline for the catapult. Once it was close enough, it reared back and prepared to blast them with its fiery breath. Puck gave the order and Daphne slammed her hand down on a red button. The giant spring inside the machine screeched and, with incredible force, the arm of the catapult whipped upward. The boulder rocketed into the sky. Eat that, ugly! Puck cried as the boulder slammed into the dragon's face. The beast bellowed and That seems to be the end of this video. I'll send more later. Goodbye.